The world around us is evolving and changing every day, and as a microcosm, so is the city of Los Angeles. One of those changes involves a huge construction project in the central city. The beloved 6th Street Bridge, also known as the 6th Street Viaduct, is getting a makeover. And what a makeover! The nearly $600 million project is the largest bridge project in the history of Los Angeles. We'll show you more about what's going on. And LA streetlights from historic to modern. They're a beacon to visitors to the city, but those lights have become a beacon to criminals too, with thefts of copper wiring plunging parts of the city into darkness. Now a pilot program may solve that problem with solar powered lights. We'll take a look. And you walk by and hardly notice them. The trees of LA growing out of the city sidewalks, providing much needed shade and pulling pollutants out of the air. We talk about LA's urban forest. Fox 11 News In Depth starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Hal Eisner. Welcome to Fox 11 News In Depth. Take a look behind me, we're in downtown LA today and behind me is the historic 6th Street Bridge. It's also known as the 6th Street Viaduct. It was constructed back in 1932, connecting the central city with Boyle Heights. Unfortunately, this famous span seen in countless movies, TV shows, and commercials had to be replaced due to damage. The new bridge that's being constructed, I'm told, will be equally impressive. And joining us right now to talk about that is Gary Lee Moore. And uh, Gary is a city engineer. And oh, wow, what a sight. <laughs> oh, well, welcome. It's uh, great to have you out here to see uh, the new 6th Street Viaduct, and it's a $588 million complete re uh, replacement. Uh, the old bridge was seismically deficient, and we did everything, but we couldn't uh, repair it, so we had to replace it. Why, why did people feel so connected to this bridge? I know it goes back to 1932, but, but there's more than that. Well, first of all, it was a real uh, way for people to get from Boyle Heights to work in downtown, and it really brought the people back and forth. And then, you know, it was in countless movies and countless TV commercials and music videos and video games, and there's a real association uh, with it that, you know, people felt a real sense of pride to know that they lived next to the 6th Street Viaduct. I have to ask you, the most famous movie that was done on here was? Well, in my opinion, it was Grease. Uh, it's just it's countless, uh, countless movies, uh, but Greece uh, definitely ranks there for me number one. And my buddy actor Barry Pearl, who was in that movie, is probably probably watching this right now. Well, what's this bridge going to look like uh, when this thing is done? And it's really going to be done this summer of 2022, really? We are going to be done this summer 2022, and we look forward to a great opening. But the difference between uh, this viaduct and the old one is it's actually going to be 40 feet wider. It's going to be 100 feet in width. And what that allows us to do is we're now going to have two 10-foot uh, bike lanes, one in each direction, which we didn't have before. We'll still have the two uh, vehicle travel lanes. Another thing it, it's going to do is it's going to have wider sidewalks. So the sidewalks are going to vary from 8 to 14 feet. But some of the other features about this is is that you'll be able to actually go from the bridge deck here where we're standing down to the ground. Now, you couldn't do that before. You had to walk all the way to the other side, which is 3,500 feet long, three quarters of a mile in length. So we're going to have five sets of stairs. And uh, something really special is we're going to have this three and a half level helical ramp. And it's going to bring you up 45 feet. And you can go with your bike or you can walk it. You'll be able to go on the south side of the bridge or it'll actually take you underneath this and bring you up to the south side. So really exciting. It seems like you're pretty excited about all this. You know, down in Long Beach, they just uh, reconstructed what the Gerald Desmond Bridge, and it, it's pretty spectacular. It's a su suspension bridge. It's got lights. The lights change color. This is iconic, of course, has been for decades. What's this going to be like now? Will it have lights? Will it be fancy? Will it be in more movies? <laughs> So one of the things about the uh, old viaduct, it, it had a couple arches over the L.A. River. And this new viaduct is, uh, we've named it the Ribbon of Light. And the reason why, there's 10 pairs of arches, and not just in the center, but the entire length. So it celebrates the whole length. And these uh, arches range in height from, there's seven that are 30 feet in tall, one that's 40 feet in tall, and two that are 60 feet tall that are over the railroads. And, as you said, they're going to light up. 
they're, they're going to have LED lights and we'll be able to change colors. So when the Dodgers win the World Series, Dodger blue. Oh, I like the way you think. Yes. And, and, and so this bridge, it, it, it's not like straightforward. The, the arches are angled off to the side. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, what's really great about this, instead of having the arches just vertical, uh, they actually lean nine degrees. They can't nine degrees. And it's amazing uh, with the cable uh, bridge here, we're able to make the bridge decks a lot thinner. So it's not a real thick bridge, it's a thin bridge. And these cables and these arches hold up the whole bridge deck. There's like 15,000 feet of cable on this new bridge. So it's quite exciting. You know, I know it's one of 14 bridges that span the LA River, uh, the most spectacular one, uh, I guess. But, you know, what, what is your sense of uh, those other bridges? Are they all in good shape? Any reason any of those will have to be fixed? Well, the good news was the Bureau of Engineering, uh, we, were, we built those other bridges and we, we've been able to seismically upgrade all those bridges. They're all safe. This bridge here, though, when it was built in 1932, they, they didn't test the rock, the aggregate. And what happened was the, the cement and the rock caused a concrete cancer and it just started cracking and cracking. And unfortunately, we did multiple very expensive repairs, but we couldn't stop it. So that's why the seismic vulnerability finally caught up with it and we had to demolish it. You know, we only have about a minute left, but when you close this, what, 2015, you close this bridge, you close it with a big block party. Uh, you're going to open it back up again this summer with a big block party? Well, we're anticipating a large party, and we definitely hope it's a multi-day party where the people and the bikes get a few days to experience it before vehicles uh, travel onto this spectacular new icon for Los Angeles. All right, well, it sounds like a lot of fun. It's, it's going to be great, I'm sure. But, you know, people who drive by this uh, freeway here, they, they take a look at this. It's a five freeway that comes off to the side. You can't miss this thing, and by 2022, you'll be actually able to drive on it, Gary. Thanks so much. Coming up next on Fox 11 News In Depth, we'll take a look at something else that's very interesting. This will be a pilot program in the city of L.A., striving to harness our abundant sunlight to light our way at night. That's next. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're looking at the 5 Freeway near downtown right now. All over the country, there's an epidemic of copper wire theft. Copper wire is very valuable. A lot of this stuff is being taken. This stuff is valuable in the sense that it can be cashed in for money. We're going to find out a lot more about this. But it's led the path to a new way to light our way. And Miguel Sangalang is with us right now. Uh, Miguel is with the uh, uh, Bureau of Street Lighting. He's the general manager of that department. Miguel, thanks for joining us. First of all, talk a little bit about this theft that's going on, uh, why you think that's happening, and what you're doing to try to fix that problem. All right. Thanks for having me, Al, and uh, appreciate being on. Well, first of all, about copper wire uh, and power theft, you know, that, that's been here since the dawn of electrical systems. So um, it's a valuable resource and commodity and something that can uh, be, uh, depending on the, the infrastructure, easily taken. Um, we've had an average of about 50 incidents prior to the pandemic a month, um, and it shot up threefold to about 200 incidents a month. And so that's been uh, causing a lot of uh, outages throughout the city, um, something that's uh, fairly difficult to repair as we're, in, we're repairing concrete, we're welding, we're bringing in different disciplines in order to fix these assets now. Well, what do you think's going on? Desperation, people just needing to find a way to get some cash? Uh, that that is part of it. Some of our infrastructure too is is quite old. We've we've been a bureau for about a hundred years now, and so some of these places uh, still need to get hardened in order to prevent uh, some of these thefts. So uh, I can see that some of the prices tagged to the the cost of copper uh, as it goes up, then the 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 lucrativeness of the business kind of goes up as well. So we're trying everything we can to to lock down and harden assets, but we're also trying out new technologies. Okay, so solar power, that's, that's the primary goal right now, is to try to light up some of these things by sunlight. Talk about that. I mean, that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, well, let me, let me start off with a, just a little bit of history before we get into that, because 12 years ago, the Bureau of Street Lighting was already ahead of the curve when it came to 
uh, LED lights, a brand new technology that other utilities weren't using yet. Uh, and we had spread out uh, throughout the hundreds of square miles of LA through our 22,000 street lighting assets, um, all of these new LEDs over the course of five years. And that's actually led to a savings of about $10 million and 70,000 metric tons of, of greenhouse gases. So uh, we, we have some experience with technology and using it. And what we're doing now, uh, thanks to an innovation fund grant through our Innovation Performance Commission, uh, we're able to try a new pilot to see if we can change our business model again. So um, what we're trying to use is solar enabled battery powered lights. There's a lot of hyphens in what I said because that's it's using a multitude of uh, technologies in order to solve these issues. Uh, but we're, what we're essentially talking about is a light that has a solar panel and a battery, a smart city controller, um, and all of it is packaged into a single fixture that we're now putting at the top of the light. What we're hoping to do is prevent lights out due to theft and vandalism by removing the, the um, presence of copper. You know, you, you can't steal what's not there, right? So uh, that's one way for us to mitigate some of the issues that we're having. Um, second, we're hoping to reduce further our greenhouse gas emissions by, by using more localized power generation and getting off the grid more. And then finally, I think uh, another innovative thing that we'll see, um, you know, God forbid any type of crisis, but um, in emergencies, our lights will actually still be on because it's it's uh, its own uh, compartmentalized uh, infrastructure. So if the grid goes down in an earthquake or a flood or or some type of uh, uh, tropical storm, our lights will actually still be on. And I, I was fascinated by that as I was doing a little research into it. I, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm sort of interested in is it's a pilot project. That means you've got X amount of lights being used at a cost of X amount of dollars. And at some point, somebody's going to reevaluate, was this a good project? Should we do it more on a wide scale basis? So what is the cost? How many lights? And if you were to do this on a wide scale basis, what are we talking about here in dollars and cents? Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, just the street lighting network alone, 222,000 lights, right? So that, that's a lot of different fixtures. And um, we're looking to, to install these for at the cost of each light about $4,000. So um, it's a considerable upfront capital cost, but I think the savings that we'll have in terms of maintenance, um, reduced energy consumption, uh, those will ultimately pay for itself over the over its lifetime. I mean, think about it. It's it's very similar to CFLs versus LEDs in your own home, right? So they cost a little bit more up front, uh, but they save you way more in the long run. One of the things I haven't heard you say is where are they being tested? Which part of town? What part of the city? Right. So uh, with our uh, Innov Innovation Fund grant, we're hoping to, to test it all throughout the city. Um, with the different geographies, you obviously have uh, the valley that we're hoping to, to do more along the coast and then downtown. Uh, but uh, we're focused right now on some of the bike paths. So uh, right now we have about five lights up uh, in the Legion Valley. Uh, there we're testing some of our, our lights to see how long they st uh, stand up, the charge stands up, how bright they are and how, how uh, efficient they, they would be in saving money. We have to wrap it up, but do you have a target date here? We're hoping by... By the end of next year, we'll have a good idea of our pilot. We feel very confident in it, and uh, we're hoping out to roll it out to the rest of the infrastructure uh, progressively over the years. Miguel Sangalang, thanks so much. Sounds interesting to, uh, uh, to use a bad pun here. Uh, glad we were able to shine a light on your project, but it's, it does sound like it's significant. It could make a difference, and we appreciate your time. Coming up next on Fox 11 News in Death, we're going to talk about trees. A little shade can make a big difference. The city of L.A. is trying to even the score when it comes to tree placement in our town. We'll talk about that right after the break. What a spectacular view of downtown Los Angeles from the 6th Street Viaduct, which is going under a makeover right now to look a whole lot different. Did you know there is such a thing as tree equity? Let me say it again. Tree equity. That's right. That's a term. Uh, the city of uh, L.A. is working on it. They're trying to uh, keep uh, an equitable amount of trees in wealthier parts of town. 
poorer parts of town. And in those poorer parts of town, there sometimes are less. And it's actually a big deal. Not only do trees provide shade and clean the air, but a recent study shows that people who live in neighborhoods with a lot of trees are healthier. Research shows they are less likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. We want to talk to Greg Potts right now. He's the chief sustainability officer and assistant director of the Bureau of Street Services. Hello, Greg. Thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and I just said a whole lot there. Explain it to me. You can get a heart attack because you don't have enough trees in your neighborhood? Well, there are um, both physical and mental health benefits to having trees in your neighborhood. Um, there's, uh, you know, maybe 10 million trees in L.A., of which about 700,000 are planted along streets. Um, and it's those street trees that my agency maintains, the Bureau of Street Services. And we're currently doing a comprehensive inventory of those 700,000 street trees and about 300,000 vacant planting locations so that we'll know all the places where we could plant a new tree. I got to ask you, I mean, first of all, who counted those 700,000 trees? And, and is there really an inequity between richer and poorer parts of town? Yes, there really is uh, inequity in our tree canopy. Um, we've hired professional arborists from a contractor to um, not only just count the trees, but measure them, identify the species, provide an exact location, and uh, diagnose any health issues with the trees. So we're going to have a comprehensive record of uh, the health of each of our street trees. Um, they've covered about 400,000 of the 700,000. And as you can see, you can access this data on a tablet. So my staff who goes out to inspect or work on a tree will be able to look up the information about that tree right there in the field. If you look at a, a map of tree canopy across the city, it looks like a map of redlining from the 1930s. The neighborhoods that were redlined in the 1930s where it was difficult uh, to get loans um, to buy a home or upgrade your property, those are tree poor neighborhoods today. And it's even more serious than ever because the city's warming. We have warm neighborhoods that currently have 30 to 40 days a year where there's a peak temperature of 95 degrees or higher. That's gonna go to 100 days a year by 2040 to 2050. So we have to start addressing the inequitable distribution of trees. And really for the first time, we're gonna have comprehensive information on the street tree population in each of our 99 neighborhood council areas. I have to ask you, and I, I don't mean to take this off to a side road, but do you think, is there anything in your research that shows that that was deliberate, that richer parts of town got better landscaping than poorer parts of town? Was that by some design? That's a great question. You know, most of the trees that have been planted both along streets and in private property were planted by private entities. The city didn't plant most of the trees. So in neighborhoods where you could finance opening a subdivision, um, you know, with a, by a large developer, like Hancock Park, for example, those neighborhoods were heavily planted with trees, both along the streets and in the, um, on the yards of the properties. And you can see that today. And then other neighborhoods where that kind of financing wasn't available because of federal redlining policy, it became much harder to invest in infrastructure of all sorts and fewer trees were planted. It also takes you know, time and money to care for trees, especially in the first five years after they're established. It actually costs us more money to water the tree for the three year establishment period than it does to plant it. So you know, providing enough resources so the trees that are planted can establish and become healthy uh, is an equity issue also. So as you go through parts of town, and I wonder if you could sort of say some of the parts of town that, that need trees that were uh, inequitably treated with canopies. Uh, do they get, do the people in the neighborhoods get to pick the kind of tree they want, or is this just the city goes out and, and gets what everybody thinks is appropriate for our climate? You know, we work with um, uh, communities to choose the right tree for the right place. Often there's several different tree species that would fit that particular parkway configuration or tree well, and we work with the community to figure out uh, which of the appropriate species they would like to have. Uh, for example, you know, there are neighborhood councils in South Los Angeles um, where you might have 20% of the 
of the spaces have palm trees in them, which have which provide no shade at all. And then another maybe 30 to 40 percent are empty. So, you know, in, in, in a neighborhood in South LA, there may only be half of the available spaces have a shade tree in them. In a really leafy tree rich area um, on the west side or Hancock Park or some of the tree rich parts of the San Fernando Valley, you know, it could be that 70 to 80 percent of the tree locations have a shade tree in them. And then also the size of the trees is important too. You know, the often the more privileged areas have older growth, larger trees with bigger canopies and uh, some of the underserved yep. neighborhoods. Well, even when they do have a shade tree, it's not quite as big and shade producing. Well, Greg Spot, thanks so much. I mean, it's, it's enlightening to hear a lot of this. I, I, I can't help but think back to that poem I learned in elementary school, something like, I think I'll never see anything as lovely as a tree. And now you've just added a whole lot of images to my mind with that poem. And thanks so much for being with us. Fox 11 News In Depth returns right after this. And finally, if you haven't already, please check out my podcast. It's called What the Hell? And it's available wherever you subscribe to your podcast or just go to whatthehowpodcast.com. That's it for this week's Fox 11 News In-Depth. Thanks for joining us. Let's take one more look at that incredible skyline of downtown Los Angeles. The foreground under construction, the historic 6th Street Bridge, also known as the Viaduct. It's opening this summer in 2022. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.